The final Attack on Titan Endgame continues, this time with the Beast Titan. So what's up guys, Fox here, Attack on Titan Chapter 118. Pretty juicy chapter and a ton of things to discuss. So be sure to give a colossal thumbs up and subscribe. Click bell notifications so YouTube actually works. Anyway, let's get started. At the start of this, you have the Beast Titan bringing down the blimps, a complete wreckage. So it turns out the prediction that a lot of us thought came true right away. This actually didn't even require the War Chief Zeke to come down and do the whole Jaeger team up thing either. The Beast Titan here was just taking the crust off the wall, as if he were peeling a freaking orange. Was the Beast Titan even using his damn claws? By the way, notice here this matching up to the exact same pose from the recent Attack on Titan Season 3 anime. The Wood Studio will definitely reuse this for Season 4, I bet. That is, if they do stick around. Next up you have Yelena, I actually love this Yelena shot. You could just feel how drenched she is after this beastly display. Too bad for her that she's not getting that banana. But back to the beast, don't forget about the beast titan targeting Peak's card titan. The leaks did mention the beast titan going on rapid fire mode and that was definitely no joke. I don't even know how Peak actually got hit here despite having plenty of time to move around some. Notice the beast titan's throw even made a dent in the freaking wall. How powerful is that? Then down below you have the Flock Squad going after Peak, so at the very least the War Chief did have the Peak Titan in mind from the start. At the same time this doubles down confirming Flock's location. Since you got Peak sticking to the wall almost like a frog, I'm wondering how much that massive cannon could affect our weight. Normally some of that metal armor plating shouldn't be an issue for a Titan, but the Car Titan is potentially the weakest Titan physically. And by the way, before moving on I do have to bring this up here. Ever since the Beast Titan appeared last chapter, this guy looked awfully small. I was thinking perhaps this was a one-time thing, but do you keep on seeing the Beast Titan in this chapter at this scale? Recall that the Beast Titan is supposedly 17 meters, while Maria being 50 meters. In other words, the Beast Titan should be roughly 25% the size of the wall, but somehow in the latest chapter he appears to be like 10% the size of the wall, or less. So what the hell, did the Beast Titan get smaller after Zeke respawned? It would be interesting if Isayama did this on purpose. Something tells me otherwise. Next up, getting back to the whole Jaws Titan Reiner situation. You get the Jaws Titan having this major Titan concussion, and the Armor Titan really just being very Armor Titan-like. The guy is completely wrecked, the top jaw and head split. Seeing this whole thing actually made me think back to Claymore. Could a Titan's body follow some similar regeneration rules? In other words, if you have some body parts completely destroyed or torn off, those are actually easier to regenerate. However, if your Titan body gets more injured in this more complex fashion, like Shattered Bones, or something like Reiner over here, could that take longer to recover, I wonder? Random thought. As for the whole battle, man does this information spread like wildfire. Feels like everyone at this point knows that Titan Aaron wants to come in contact with the Royal Blood Furry Titan. See? Gabby turned out to be useful. And talking about Gabby, you have the grim adventures of Billy and Gabby, tying to get to the super secret base. I could really only hope that Isayama was greatly disappointed in the final Game of Thrones season to really not make Gabby into this Arya super plot armored character. And this is coming from an Arya fan. But anyway, some key pieces of information dropped here. Colt mentioned that blimp they have in reserve to escape. So let me throw this out there. I'm not 100% convinced Isayama will use this yet, but he actually has given himself an option to do so. That is, for Marley to actually run away to either back to Marley or some other part of the island. Which really just means, this whole finale could take a little longer than expected. Next up, the update on the Falco and Nao combo. I found it interesting how Nao was being super friendly to this Marley kid. For Nao, he has no clue on Falco's background. Plus, Falco's just a kid, so nothing too shocking here. What's more damning is Nao actually coming in terms with him becoming a titan soon. This right here feels like Isayama is watering the sea, so it stings a little bit more when it does happen. Then Nao just had to mention his daughter. If we don't really get too much more from Nao, I got a feeling he's going to try to pass a message to his family using Falco. After all, Falco already has plenty of experience being that messenger boy for the opposite team. Nao could be sending a final party message on paper or vocally. Anyway, switching it over to Mikasa and the Stallion. Freaking finally an end to the jail time. So originally months back when they got into jail, I predicted Eren would probably let them out on his own. So, does this count? Just via Oyangkobon. And yes, on Yankobon. I like how this guy is like, buddies, I'll let you guys out. Just forget about me tricking you guys, giving you crappy jail food, and all that horrible stuff in the past few days. Time to look forward. Keep advancing. Oh, and by the way, how about the greatest of your friends, our lord and saver Aaron Yeager. If you do have a moment, don't forget about his hairy brother. As I was expecting, you have Kony going into full potato rage mode on this guy. Kony was extremely pissed off. So much betrayal. So you can't really blame the guy. 
I do have to point out though, it really reminded me of the raging Eren from Attack on Titan Season 1. Someone get this man a Titan. And Oyakobon really should have discussed some terms or at least the situation before letting them out. I'm still questioning how true that statement is about him getting his head blown off. As for the rest of his claim, supposedly only a few knew about the actual wine situation and how even he was kept in the dark about the zero baby option plan. Part of me wants to believe him. Then again, somehow he didn't know any of this when he was best buddies with the super tall Yelena. I also do want to take a look at the original Japanese text before buying this one way or another. But how about you? Are you buying what this guy is selling? I mean, even Hanji believed them a few chapters back, and you saw how that turned out. At the very least from all of this, you do have Armin choosing to believe him. He does have some sound logic here. Just going years back when Oyakobon mentioned something about them all having been created for a reason, including the Paradise Island Devils. Part of me does want to say this also feels in line with Armin's more wishful thinking that you've seen during the time skip. This yearn from Armin wanting to get along with others, resolving things via minimal conflict. Talking it out. Ultimately, this could lead to Armin's downfall again. Then for the topic about the euthanasia plan, postponed. Good luck with that. I really want to see this whole meetup between Rogue Eren and Kony. If Eren was serious, for Kony, it might turn out like what happened to Armin a few chapters back. A complete wipeout. Either way, it seems like the actual rumbling demo is still on the table, thankfully. At this point, it just keeps on getting indefinitely delayed. It's June right now, and maybe, maybe you might see it by Christmas. Next up, Mikasa here. I was really hoping to hear something out of her other than her still wanting to help out Eren. At least to give the girl some credit, she is questioning whether this is via her own choice. Notably this panel without that damn scarf. Damn it Mikasa, you need an anchor bond with best girl Armin over here. At least temporary. Ultimately, the whole situation comes down to Armin still being fully on board Team Eren. Such a strong belief from this guy that Eren would go against Zeke's no baby option plan. That's even after he got his ass kicked down with that beatdown. Or it could just be Stockholm Syndrome. But seriously, this goes back to very accurate leaks. It really feels like it's Isayama finally explaining the whole situation via Armin here. Which is pretty important since I've seen so many readers lost on this. Armin explained how Yelena put Eren in this very difficult position ever since they met a few years back. Instead of Eren going against Yelena, Eren must have noticed how off and how much of a wild card Yelena was. Better get this blonde Amazon on my side. I'll first charm her, then she'll freely lead me to Zeke. Then, take a look at the shot of Armin with the Colossal Titans over the district. This really feels like a parallel to the shot of Eren's years back discussing this plan to the government. Overall, nothing too new here except they're actually adjusting the focus, really doubling down on Armin's realization. You don't need all the millions of Colossal Titans. A small Colossal Titan demo could easily destroy the world's forces. Which really now goes back to Eren's initial plan, trying to get the world's powers all against them. That way, they could all focus and team up with Marley. The real question still remains though, how many of these world forces are actually in Marley right now? Then for the stallion here, oh my god, this guy just adores Eren. Can't let that bastard die, not yet. Even the vengeful Kony was moved by Armin in the stallion. As for Mikasa's alone time with Armin, so at least right here you have her questioning Eren's past actions, which I like seeing. However, I had hoped that Mikasa had already done this mental exercise while in the freaking jail cell. Instead, it almost seems like Mikasa's trying to get an answer from Armin. I'm hoping that it's more like a second opinion instead. Then for Armin thinking back, back to the ocean scene at the end of chapter 90, which is where the Attack on Titan season 3 anime should be stopping. He pretty much boils it down to mixing the truth with the lying to make it more believable, something I really expected from Armin. And right here, I'm really seeing that Armin realize something that he's not letting Mikasa know. Armin still does believe about the slave and headache stuff. The way that Eren put it was a lie, but there's obviously some truth or connection here. Recall that Mikasa just slammed Armin down without even knowing what she was doing. I highly doubt Mikasa was thirsty for his blonde milkshake. Next up, time to suit up. I was really liking how the Stanley was putting on this ballsy commander move on the new recruits. Oh yeah, just shoot me. See how far that gets you. And hey, a Keith cameo. Oh, don't mind me. I just happened to have fallen down the stairs. Ha ha ha, you should have seen the other guy. Anyway, welcome back to Pixies. Really gotta love Commander Pixies getting back in charge again. Unfortunately, this guy and the other wine connoisseurs are like a ticking time bomb. You got only the anti-wine troops heading out, which really cuts down on the number. That's not even counting the limited 3D maneuver gear. Also, take a look at this shot. The three past divisions once again working together in the same location. Next up, some Mikasa time with her blonde mini-me. I'm actually so glad that the leaks were so spot on for this. Mikasa did in fact leave that stanky scarf behind. You could really just take away a mountain of symbolisms from this thread being sliced. This actually makes me wonder two things. 
One, is Louis over here about to snatch her scarf? Watch her appear wearing it in the battlefield or hand it to Mikasa later on. And two, random ass theory. But could the Ackerbon be linked strongly to some item for some Ackerman? In the case of Mikasa, that obviously being her red scarf. Black in the manga. I'm not saying that the Ackerbon is completely tied to something which may not even have to be physical, but there seems to be a strong connection existing with it. Perhaps Mikasa's more free now. Next up, back to Eren's Warhammer Titan. It looks like this guy awfully slowed down quite a bit this chapter. And what is this guy doing running towards Zeke? I really have no idea why you, you wouldn't quickly gobble freaking Reiner up and the Jaws Titan too. It would take like a minute. Does Eren just feel bad for them? I mean, as long as Reiner's around, the plot armor Titan's gonna continue getting in your way. Oh, and goddammit, Yelena, you're like a mini Titan. Cause really, she's creepier than a lot of mindless Titans you've seen. She definitely has that face you could trust. Trustworthy. Let's see if Yelena actually does something useful while the other guys are out, besides just looking at stuff. You can only imagine what type of suggestion she gave to Armin. Anyway, let's roll out guys. Everyone fully equipped with those thunder spears. Took their damn time. Then the entire hometown area. Hey, doesn't this burning destruction look awfully familiar? You have blimps crashing down, but that's not enough. You really need that colossal nuke just to bring everything back. One thing to notice about the blimps is that it looks like the beast hadn't already quickly knocked them all down. At this point, they might only have one, the one that Colt mentioned. Anyway, getting back to your favorite girl, and some random extra. At least now you're getting a confirmation about this anti-Titan rifle. Supposedly, it does have the power to take out even a Titan shifter. You just have to be super precise. That's definitely going to be coming into play. As for good guy Nayo, no good deed goes unpunished. Predicting it now. Here, it feels like Isayama's just sharpening the dagger for what's coming up. Then, for your best girl, Gabby. Yay for the female Eren development. She's definitely lost some of her bite. Even Gabby herself could only stay silent after noticing herself pulling back. Although, really, who did not see this cliche, obvious change of heart coming for Gabby? Pretty much everything involving Gabby after the attack on Marley events has been by the numbers. And watch, Isayama might actually end up making Gabby a key player in the Marley people that vanishes for the Paradise Island Eldians. Right here, you have Gabby and Falco coming to their own realizations and acceptance. For Gabby, hey, the devils on Paradise Island aren't half bad and not actually devils. Then for Falco, you're not that bad, Gabby. At least you only killed one potato. Unlike me, who ignited the flames on our home. And to top it all off, Falco's confession of love for this little monster. Aww, has Isayama gotten softer after his recent marriage? But who are we kidding? Some obvious death flags being set for Falco. You even have some pretty conflicting logic there too. Falco, let me just remind you, warriors don't live that long. Not unless your name is Reiner. As for some Gabby positive thing, I actually love the shot from Gabby. It is an obvious parallel, but a wonderful one from when Falco did the same after the attack on Marley. Although I feel Colt is being much too wishful. The war chief may stop if he founds out you're tainted. Right. Zeke is gonna be like, hell yeah, some more live ammunition. Anyway, back to the people you actually care about. Mikasa, Mr. Horse, and the others on the rooftop. How are these guys even alive with that much gunfire? Can't those weapons pierce the rooftop? Hey Marley guys, use your anti-Titan rifle on that chimney. Anyway, back to the Titan battlefield. So even at this point, the Jaws Titan was still not put out of his misery. Come on, Eren, go nutcracker on his ass. Except aim a bit higher. I would have also expected the Z to try to make his way down, but looks like his Donkey Kong ass likes the high ground. Alright, so getting into the Beast Titan developments this chapter. Once again, the War Chief Zeke getting overconfident. You really let those scouts you didn't even know completely handle Peak? When are you guys gonna learn to freaking double tap? Instead, you have Peak pulling a freaking Eren like the recent Attack on Titan anime episode. This whole situation could have been solved easily if they just thunder speared the hell out of that cannon. I would also expect the Peak Titan to be able to do like 10 plus Titan transformations in a row. So surprise attacks and sneaky tactics like this should have been a given, especially for Zeke. You worked with her for years. But not to worry, not to worry. Only a chunk of Zeke's arm got blown off. Zeke has experienced much worse. And don't worry, that special plot armor Titan girl may still be around. Anyway, much like the recent Attack on Titan Season 3 anime stuff, the battle keeps on shifting size every few chapters. It would actually be somewhat of a twist if Zeke actually died. For real this time. This will ultimately force Paradise Island into this much worse position, potentially having to bring the Historia option again. Then for the cliffhanger this chapter, for me it was really only for Zeke. Let me ask you, do you mind if any of the three here die? At least right now, I really wouldn't mind what happens to the trio down here. If anything, Falco going Titan mode could bring in some juicy drama, especially for Reiner and Gabby. 
Overall in this chapter, what were the best and worst parts for you? For me, we got a little bit too much of the Gabby adventure this chapter, and also whatever his name is, Colt. This goes back to my question earlier about who really cares about these two. From what I've seen from most of you posts, you guys straight out hate Gabby's guns. The best part of this chapter was definitely seeing everyone getting out of the jail cell suited up. Unfortunately for Eren, it felt like he's taking his sweet time recovering. Better knock his night. You know, since they dropped that piece of information. Then for the war chief Zeke, even more of this chapter doubling down on him not being some type of mastermind. At the rate this is going, it actually might get more interesting if the Beast Titan does kick it, for real. This way, you could get some sort of confirmation on a future baby getting the Titan powers. It would also leave Levi and Connie without getting any sort of revenge. In other words, very Attack on Titan-like. Ultimately, a Titan Shifter death would set things back heavily for Paradise Island. This would give room for you to say I'm going to do some sort of time skip too. By the way, really quickly, let me mention the Patreon. I'm actually going to start doing an Attack on Titan only live stream. That'll be an additional second live stream on top of the monthly one. That'll be this weekend, so definitely don't miss that. Check the Patreon link down below. You're going to be getting at least two streams for the low tier option, plus the other perks. Starting now, you can actually tweet me your questions for next week's Attack on Titan 118 discussion. Guaranteed question for Patreon supporters. As always, those normally are scheduled for Friday, although they make it shifted up a day or two, depending on the schedule. Anyway, how awesome was this week's monthly Attack on Titan chapter? Post anything I missed down below. So, definitely give a close thumbs up, check out my recent Promer video, don't sleep on that anime. A ton more Attack on Titan videos coming up, and I'll see you guys later.